All right, everybody, we're back. We had another top 10 list for you today. I'm joined by, of course, the Ray Mysterio, or the Batista to my Ray Mysterio. Please don't throw me against the side of the turnbuckle. <laughs> I was about to call you it's the Ray okay. Mysterio to my that Batista. Was, well, I don't know why, but. I, I was going to say, it, it, it happens. I mean, it happens. Boyaka, 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 if you will. They were the original best friends. Sadly, you won't see either guys on this top 10 list because we kind of did have a bit of a problem uh, running down to like the last couple names, and I think other names outweighed yeah, like, them there, both, there, There's a bunch of honorable mentions that we that we can throw out there, but yeah. for the sake of just the top 10, we had to just sit, stick with the names we got for this top 10. Mm-hmm. There's a lot of names that were obviously for consideration. Either you could easily throw another thirty names out there that could have been could have been considered. Easily, I think that's the key thing. Is ruthless aggression spawned a lot of stars that, even though they might not have gone long term success, they still had the success outside of the WWE long term in the, terms of like. Like the thing is, is th- this was the one. T- this is the one era where. I feel like people made immediate impacts, and you know, although if they didn't stick around very long, they just made that immediate impact. Like your Muhammad Hassan's, he was only around for about a year, but he was basically uh, mid Carter at lowest, and he was about. You could honestly make an argument he was a main eventer toward the end of everything. Exactly. But speaking of beast from. Not the West, but the East. Number 10, Brock Lesnar. Man, we could just talk days about what Brock Lesnar is doing right now and what he did post-WWE yep. at this time. But in terms of the Ruthless Aggression era, the key thing about Brock Lesnar is that he really he really uh, he, stirred the pot he, when it came to wrecking He helped himself. encompass this whole era he helped encompass it like as a backbone for this kind of thing Mm -hmm. and you're gonna see a lot of these ovw guys uh make it on the list because they they were a very good it's that whole uh, thing i just i I mentioned immediately immediately jumped up and they were at the top of the game uh, right away they Mm -hmm. they took that chance wb took those chances letting these young guys roll with the ball and they succeeded with it Exactly. I think that's something that WWE is doing a lot of um, pushing away towards, sadly, is that they're not really letting these young guys get the opportunity to just roll with the ball. They're letting them, you know, grind out a year or longer in NXT and then try this stuff out on, uh, you know, the main roster. Whereas in OVW, they could get a little bit of testing stuff out, but it might not uh, be as useful because they don't have the cameras on them. Um, That's what it's like. That conversation we had earlier about uh, during SmackDown about Ken Doan. Yep. Exactly. It's he, he he when he when he started way back in during this time too. He's not on the list, but he's another name that we could have easily considered the whole Spirit Squad. We could have considered. Mm-hmm. A lot of just young but fresh guys. He's another name. He he started when he was like maybe twenty twenty one. He was he was wrestling on Raw. When I was twenty twenty one, I was sitting in college classes. And Brock Lesnar was young at this point in his career to just be a beast straight out of uh, college. You know, from amateur wrestling to the world of professional wrestling and to dominate the, the sport. You know, it's one heck of an accomplishment he, for the beast. He's one of those people that made the smart decision to basically bring over a lot of collegiate wrestling moves. Mm-hmm. So his his move said he didn't have to basically learn professional wrestling as much as he had to just say, you know what, I'm just going to be a wrestler. Mm-hmm. And definitely putting it with Paul Heyman was a great, great decision. But not to just stroke Brock Lesnar's ego uh, more so he'll be our best friend so we can be BFFs forever. Uh, let's jump into number nine. Who, number nine, um, as I was talking, I completely switched my mind. I was going to say Chris Jericho, but I would say Shelton Benjamin, going back to that group of OVW guys still, because Shelton Benjamin, the the character of Shelton Benjamin is really good. If you look at the character of Shelton Benjamin, 
that's something like it develops we very had well. nowadays i mean sure we had our we had our funny moments with his well, mama we had the serious moments when he was tag teaming with charlie haas stuff with kurt angle of course his his independent uh not independent run, but his uh, mid card run as as Intercontinental Champion as Intercontinental Champion, phenomenal. You know, during that time, so he. Do you remember when he picked up the victory against Triple H? Yeah, it's no one was beating Triple H at that point. No nobody, one was that nobody point. beats Triple H. <laughs> nobody, but he and did. Shelton it. pulled it off exactly, and to continue on that Triple H. Stairway to go to number eight, Randy Orton. It's, Randy Orton has done so much on the company. If he wanted to, he could just leave. Like he's literally done it all. I don't think there's really. I mean, Money in the Bank, but this is you know modern day. Um, you know, I don't think he's going to Rumble, but you know, main evented uh Mania. I'm pretty sure he's main evented many pay per views. He's got many titles. I think he has think, won a Rumble. I think that one with. That one match with Ben Wall that solidified his career as World Heavyweight Champion, it put him on the map and it, it gave him that that bullseye that just added to the story of evolution devolving on each other. And it, it's great for Randy Orton because he was so young at the time. I mean, you, you take yeah, another it's a young guy kid who, out of college. You had you had guys put their faith in him. You had guys like Ric Flair and Triple H mm-hmm. put their faith in a guy like Randy Orton based on his lineage, family lineage. Mm-hmm. And when I say those guys out of college, and even though some of them didn't go exactly to college, I'm talking about that you know early twenty-ish years um, where they can really make an impact, and they're in there slowly getting in their prime to make that impact. And I think. The, the key thing behind Randy Orton is he had the, the experience from his father and grandfather, you know, Cowboy, uh, Bob Orton Jr. and all that. He has natural charisma. He he just had natural charisma. You're right. I think he was such a he was such a likable person that was very dislikable at the same time. And there's one match very in, in particular that really hit me as a child when I saw it live and that was Randy Orton versus Mick Foley and I think that's one thing that really changed the game of how I looked at professional wrestling because sure it had that level of hardcore where people might not like that element but at the same time it added to the story of the man that was Randy Orton you know the legend killer the viper everything you know that he went through and I think that's that's one thing that you know, personally, I feel like Orton maybe should be much higher on this list. But when you look at these other names uh, during this time period, I'm sure they were a little bit bigger than him. But I think Orton definitely guy staying the test of time for his story. Um, but there's a guy bigger than him, and I'm gonna roll into it as number seven is the Heartbreak Kid, Shawn Michaels. All right, we're having okay. a hard cut for Shawn Michaels coming in at number seven. All right, Shawn Michaels, a guy who had one heck of a career. Could end it there, you know, when he lost his smile, when he came back from a career-altering, ending, maybe life-threatening injury. And then he comes back, gets the world title, gets it from his best friend, then he'll feud with his best friend for a couple years. Then he'll go on to team with his best friend, you know, reforming DX, you know, break it down, everything. And then he just, you know, has that, that last match with Taker twice. But... You know, and he also retires Ric Flair. He really, above and beyond, changed his career and put himself over the top in this. And I think that's that's something to really look at, is that Shawn Michaels took his career. It's to really look at is it was already good, and he made it even, he managed to make it even better. He, he took his career, and he took his life, and he turned it around. Because if you look at Shawn Michaels, before the ruthless aggression era he was a much different man he was a angrier man and to see him change his life around for the better and have just so much fun with it and then we still had i think you know some people would be like oh Shawn michaels just great during the 90s 
I lived through the Earth's discretion era more than I lived through the 90s, and I would, you know, highly argue that Shawn Michaels in this time period was far superior, and stuff he did is just crazy. I mean, sure, he was well, a part of the right Monday Wars and everything. You, 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 can never, you can never give back or take away anything like you can with putting talent over. Mm-hmm. I think that was a key thing. He, he helped put, create so like, many stars in this. He, he, ne- he, never, he never put anyone over back then. Yeah, exactly. If Sean wasn't if Sean wasn't winning, he was t- he was going to Vince and saying, "Hey, we're changing the storyline." And that would rub off on his best friend, of course, which we'll get to in the list. Um, but I think this era of Shawn Michaels is where he he really did give back to the the industry. I mean, he he bled more during this time. He cried and sweated and gave more five star matches, in my opinion, with people. You know, he really, he really tore down the house with, uh, with the Ruth's discretion era. So, but that's Michael's for you. On to number six, Kurt Angle. Like, is there anything you can really good. like not say about Kurt Angle? I mean, for a short amount of time, came in, did what needed to be done, just went on his way. And I, goodness. He might be the greatest in-ring worker in the history of the WWF slash E. And he's still wrestling at his age, if you think about it. Like he's after everything he's been through, he's still he's still going like a train at a hundred and plus miles per hour. I mean I was gonna say like hundred and fifty, but of course I mean you can always go faster than that, but I mean I'll say hundred and fifty percent he was given. Angle gave more than enough needed. Angle was one of those guys in the ring who was so technically sound that he made everyone else look so much better when he was around. And especially when you had those matches, you know, I always think about Lesnar and Angle. And just, goodness, you had a powerhouse and then you had a technically sound worker tearing it down. Alright, on to number I see ten, nine, eight, seven, six, five. Rob Van Dam. The whole effing show. Sorry, that's his teen eight theme song. No, this is but, one of my I was gonna say this is my ad to this list. Cause all like he's he tore it down during the Ruthless Aggression era. He's the reason Let's why he said he was back. I mean for that tr- little while. Triple but, crown champion. Triple crown champion. Mm-hmm. He, he he got the Intercontinental title. He was a hardcore champion too. People don't really think about that. European champion as well. He, I just like he the actually fact won that every belt he possibly could. I just like the fact that he had the EC title. EC, EC the EC. I just don't even. It's not a good day. <laughs> the ECW championship and the WWE you know, little spinner belt championship. He beat it from John Cena. When the odds were completely stacked against John Cena, sure, and you know Edge came in, but it's also the fact of like that ECW one night stand pay per view was for him, like it was for RVD to put his career in that building and just throughout I'm time. I'm pretty sure, yeah, that, I'm pretty sure that's why they did that. And he was probably a big part of that. And it was just it's it's crazy to see RVD. He's another one of those guys that, you know, he did stuff before for ECW, clearly. But in a short amount of time, he did so much. It's just crazy. A heck of a worker. So, claps to RVD. Uh, Number four is the Rated R Superstar Edge. Um, You go from having that comedic gimmick, uh, running around with his best buddy Christian, to, you know, when Christian leaves and everything, and... Edge is just taking off. Like, Edge is what, what do we do with him? Edge becomes the radar superstar. He's spearing Mick Foley, teaming up with Mick Foley, going through flaming tables, barbed wire. Then he has, you know, beats up John Cena's dad. Like, he was the original hashtag beat up John Cena. Money in the Bank twice. Exactly. Twice. Two times. He money did it in first. Sorry, CM Punk. But Edge did it first. And he cashed in successfully both times. And so did Punk. But still, Edge. 
I think his cash ins twice meant so much because hey, they... he he won it twice. Hey, he 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 cash he won the back money in the bank twice mm -hmm. and then won it from Mr. Anderson once. Yes, I think it's just crazy to see the rated R superstar. He's a guy who I wish had a longer career, but I think at one point he got to that stage where he could have just called it game over. He just did so much. Which actually, shout out real real quick, shout out to Edge real quick. I mean, I don't know when this video is going to be released and whatnot, but mm -hmm. he was just married over the weekend. To nice. Beth Phoenix, another ruthless aggression era. Hats Super off star. to you, sir. Hats off, hats off to you. Uh, coming in at number three is The Undertaker. Now we can say a lot about The Undertaker. The Undertaker. Uh, we can say a lot about The Undertaker. Uh, you know, from early 90s, late 90s, and then this mid-2000s area is really, you know, we're getting out of the biker taker. But this area where he becomes the phenom. He, he becomes like the flagship guy of SmackDown, you know? Yeah, you're having, the you're having like SmackDown tag team match for. player. You're going one on one with The Undertaker player. Like, it's it's a time to be watching SmackDown during, you know, yeah. Taker's run what there. What do you know? SmackDown was, SmackDown was good back then, too. Ta Taker was Mr. SmackDown. And, uh, I mean, I don't really think we need to say more about The Undertaker, because if you don't know what he did during this time, it's kind of, kind of like, are you watching? It, honestly, because Taker, you just go rewatch Taker stuff during this time. It's crazy. I mean, I can only say so much for each person before it becomes repetitive and you just know the gist of they all kind of did same things, but in different styles and different stories. Um, but there's one man who had a very unique story coming in at number two, and that's the game, Triple H. He got his little handlebar mustache working with Evolution, beating the utter crap out of his best friend, Shawn Michaels, creating this elite group with the young Randy Orton, the, you know, the animal Batista, and the nature boy, Ric Flair, and just slowly turning on all of them. And I remember... His mentor. I remember very vividly as a child watching Triple H stab this old man in the forehead with a screwdriver and <laughs> I think at that moment that was when I was like this right here like this this shows why Triple H is a bad mother effer like you just know Triple H is a guy you don't want to mess with he has the power behind you don't, the camera you don't and the guy during the, the camera and he can have fun. Like, do you do thing. you remember that scene whenever? Because uh, this was during the ruthless aggression era too, I uh -huh. believe, when he invaded Randy Orton's home. Yes, he. Well, it was late. Uh, late ruthless aggression it might actually be a little post ruthless aggression during the, you know, beginning of the PG era. But I still would say it was a ruthless aggression thing. Yeah, came into. Randy Orton's home, beat the crap out of him, he scared his wife at Randy the time. Orton's home, threw him through the front window. Yeah, it was great. It's great. It was great. It was great. Of course, he did stuff with uh, best Triple friend H, forever. It's it's like Shawn what we Michaels. were what, what we were talking about with Shelton Benjamin. Mm -hmm. Shelton Benjamin was maybe the only guy I can think of that got a singles victory, a clean singles victory over Triple, Triple H. H. During this time, Triple H was just unstoppable. He was that guy. Like if you were. Playing, if if fantasy wrestling was a thing, God, I hope it never becomes a thing. <laughs> I hope but it never becomes side a thing. Note, I hope it never becomes a thing. <laughs> but if it was, he was that number one pick in those drafts you were taking. Yep. And coming in at number you one, knew he was going to get you victories. Coming in at number one is a guy who will get you a long term victory, though. If he was your number one draft, is John Cena. This guy was. John Cena. He's the face of everything he at this. Like he, 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 yeah, he you're right. He ushered in the era. Yeah, he ushered in the era. You know, this is ruthless aggression. Just, I didn't like the punch to Kurt Angle, <laughs> to be honest. But it could have gone a lot better. <laughs> but I think long term, you know, those words really echoed because they defined I his like legacy. His attire, his attire I, is most no, generic. No, <laughs> I, he, you know, he started off rough. 
he was a prototype John Cena, and then he became Superman John Cena. And I mean, I'll admit it. I was he chain gang for jobs. life. Yeah, I was a chain gang, you know, member well, for life. Everybody was at that the, time. It was one of those things. Everyone tuned into. Everyone like that's the one thing my cousin still remembers. Like he he used to watch all the time. Then he mm-hmm. recently got back into it. But he still remembers those little quick one liners John Cena would say during his little pre stuff. <laughs> I just like when he had the wrap offs and everything. But John Cena, I mean, another guy easily on this list. You don't really need to talk too much about because you know the story. He overcame the odds. You've seen and it. And ever since then, like John the, Cena he's is. He's a guy I've literally had the pleasure to watch his entire career. People can give him all the crap they want. I've watched his entire career, mm-hmm. and he's impressed me from day one. Exactly. And uh, as I was saying, with. John Cena with the long term success and of course as you were saying with following his entire career sure his character might not as evolved too much as other people like Triple H um the one thing about John Cena is that he kept consistent to his word you know so but if you are a master of thugonomics and you just got your doctorates I want you to smash that like button, give us some comments down below, tell us why somebody should not be on the list, or why are you going to put somebody else on the list. Yeah, let us know your opinions. Let your let us know who you think we snubbed. Let your voice be heard. Think. And we'll Most hear definitely. from you next time.